on closet there. Hmm. Question. No, point of clarity. <coughs> point of clarity. Is, it, is it not the case that when we talk about Kant in the categorical imperative, and we are talking about his, um, we have an internal recognition of the goodness of law, that it is only when we feel that those laws were right and justly made. Okay, hold on. No, that's just a mistake. Mm. Okay. Okay, so now, the moral law is a priori. Right. It's not made. I was talking about when Kant specifically talked about man-made law. What you're trying to do, okay, well, he talks about man-made law, that's different. Okay. Okay, that's, and he talks about that in several documents where he gets into uh, politics and history. Right. But in his moral theory, okay, what we're talking about here, and he, he, he says his starting point, see, Aristotle's starting point is, what does everybody want? What's universal among humans? Every single human, Aristotle reasoned, wants to be happy. Um, Kant starts, he says that, well, happiness isn't the highest good. It's not the most perfect good. And he says, the highest good is unqualified. And so what is good without qualification? Now, it's something counterfactual. And it's important to appreciate that, I think. It's something counterfactual, but something a priori. OK, and so it's the moral law, and it's something reason discerns, and it's almost platonic. Um, and, and so um, and he says explicitly you know, that uh, even if you're a Christian, the example of Christ might be the goal in virtue, virtue theory style, Aristotle style, as a model that you imitate in order for you to acquire virtues. But it's not good without qualification. What's good without qualification is what is the guide of the person who has the habit of doing right. And so you, use the, you refer to the categorical imperative so you can teach yourself how to be moral. But don't confuse your, think, your thinking process with morality itself. Morality itself, this principle of law, is, is abstract, counterfactual, and exists separate from any of us, but can be accessed by all of us, and that's its importance. It's universality that all of us have access to it. And he thought simple-minded humans have access to it, probably even better than sophisticated humans do. Okay? So, oh, pleasure. So, um, so we want to get at what morality is, so I, just, I think we've just addressed that. For Kant, morality is this abstract principle that we go through a thought process to discern. And the thought process he recommended was the categorical imperative. And he gave four different permuta uh, formulations. Four different formulations of it. The general formulation, the formulation from nature, the formulation from ends, and the uh, respect for persons. Okay, Kingdom of ends, respect for persons. Treat everyone as though they are an end and, uh, in themselves and not merely a means. So don't use anyone. Kingdom of ends. Uh, act as though you are legislating the kingdom of heaven, as it were. I, I shorten it that way. I hope I'm doing justice to God here. Um, and the formulation of nature says, act as though your will were to be a law of nature. And so you picking this meant that it would be repeated by everyone else, as though it was a law of nature. Just like every time an apple falls, it falls and other apples in the same situation will fall. No exception. So if you choose to lie, act as though everyone else would choose to lie. Okay? So um, Kant gives different formulations of it, but the idea is that it should help you to discern what morality is, which is treating everyone um, in the same manner, given the same position in place. Um, and he was inspired by Rousseau. Rousseau was getting at the general will, which has the same uh, logical status. The general will is not what is what is legislated. It is what guide legislation. Right. Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, so that's one modern notion of morality. It's this abstract principle that reason discerns that um, tells you what is right or wrong. The other dominant point of what morality is is the consequentialist approach that says morality is producing good consequences. And um, Mill produced um, his principle of utility in order for us to clarify for ourselves when we're being moral. And it's that our action benefits um, the most of humanity. And benefit means it, it produces their happiness, their pleasure, 
and it minimizes the pain they're suffering. Um, the principle of utility, and we want it for as, uh, as many possible. Now, what's crucial for you to see in both of these uh, articulations of morality, as I mentioned earlier, is that they're self-sacrificing. Um, if there's a universal law that you have to obey, that means you have to put your ego desire to the side. And categorical imperative is, is special logically because it always applies categorical. It's not as Kant criticizes um, Aristotle's approach. It's not hypothetical. Aristotle says, do these things to acquire these virtues because you want the end of being happy. So you're acquiring virtues like being noble and, and, and being just because you want to be happy. You're not doing it for its own sake. It's hypothetical. If you no longer want to be happy, if you are socially maladjusted and you just want to be a motherfucker, <laughs> you don't want to be happy, right? And you want to piss on people who do want to be happy, right? You, none of that stuff works for you anymore. It's no longer rational, right? Um, so the categorical imperative applies even when you don't want it to, <laughs> right? So that's. The fact that you're going to be moral is you know, this little saint in you. You're going to be moral because, you know? And too bad if you're unhappy, right? And so it is with uh, utilitarianism. People tend to focus on the pleasure, the hedonism, and the most people being happy. But when you make the calculation, your happiness is just one beam against seven million other, six billion, seven billion counting, yeah. beams, right? So if you're bean counting, the outcomes and consequences, what makes you happy is just one tiny grain of sand in the beach of humanity, right? So I'm going to have to defer to the end. I, just have, I have a question. Oh, well, to the end. So I'll have a Q, we'll have a Q&A. Okay. We'll have a Q&A. So, so morality is self-sacrificing, okay? Now, here's the um, universal history piece and the narrative of justice. Okay, so universal history is um, um, a dialogue, uh, a discourse, I should say, that developed in Europe, and we've had a few uh, uh, milestones in its development. Okay, so one was uh, when Vico produced his book in 1725 on learning, and he talked about how we are historical beings. And he developed a kind of universal history, a story of all humans. And it articulated um, a, a view of human nature that was universal. But it, he articulated two very important things. One, that we have a universal nature that's shared. And two, that we're historical beings. Okay. Now the next person, the next luminary to address universal history is Immanuel Kant. Uh, oh, excuse, I'm wrong. I'm, I'm saying that wrong. It's not Kant, it's Herder. Okay. Um, <coughs> Johann, um, what's Herder's full name? I'm sorry. H E R D E R. Herder. Very important in the. Um, uh, he's, he's important for so much. I'm not going his, he, he, He's written many things on universal history. He started writing his ideas on <coughs> universal history before Kant produced his more famous idea for universal history from a cosmopolitan point of view. Uh, and he reviews Herder's work in, um, shortly after he produces the, um, his ideas of universal history from a cosmopolitan point of view. Now, a Herder adds to, um, complicates what was achieved by Vico. And Herder says that we have a universal human nature and there can be a universal history. But Herder talks about human nature as itself being a historical pro product. So there isn't this easy assumption that all humans share the same human nature. Because your human nature is affected by history, because your nature is a historical product, there are diversions in what we can know and understand as human nature. And so, Herder develops this idea that we have a universal nature, 
but because of the diversions of culture, right, in different human societies, because of different human histories, there has to be a process that he called feeling in. This long process you had to go through so that people could get to from where I'm at in my, let's say, English culture to where you're at in, let's say, your Middle Eastern culture. Or if I were going to get to, I have to go from my Middle Eastern culture to the African culture. Right? So if we're going to have an experience of each other in our human nature, we have to be prepared to go through the historical cultural differences that develop between the different historically developed human peoples. Okay. Now, uh, the next uh, idea is uh, Kant, and Kant uh, comes up with universal history, and his big famous thing is that he predicted a world government um, in, in the idea of uh, universal history from a cosmology point of view. And this cosmology spirit is important, but I'm not going to talk too much about it, but it's this uh, ability for you to see past your nation, to see an emerging culture developing that uh, doesn't just suit your nature, your, your nation but is really about um, a cosmopolitan culture that's shared. Okay. Um, so Kant has a theory of human nature as well. But what's relevant here is that Kant had a theory of race, and it was very racist. And what Kant really had in mind about universal uh, history was he, more or less he assumed that Europeans were going to, as he put it, give law to the rest of mankind, okay? And in many ways, he was prophetic because Europeans did indeed um, establish a system of law, system of governance, and syst uh, networks of power that went on in the coming centuries to conquer the planet. Make no mistake about it. Now, the next person for universal history is, 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 is Hegel. And Hegel is writing about universal history, and he's saying, one a very important point in his book on um, the philosophy of history is he says that the Europeans have internalized the skills necessary, the virtues necessary to actually write a universal history. Because many Europeans have the training to be good reporters. You see, it's like if you want to do good science, you have to get good evidence collection, right? So in order to write good universal, to do a universal history, you have to have people out there in a position to acquire the knowledge of the world so that it's suitable for constructing such a narrative that will be accurate and academic, you know, worth, worth your time because it's going to get you the truth, okay? And he, so this is another important idea and, 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 and fact that if we're going to have a universal history, people have to be armed with uh, methodologies and tools that we have universal agreement about, okay? Now the next important person along my story about universal history is um, W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois, um, in an article called The Conservation of Races, um, gave a, much, a very celebrated um, social historical conception of race um, in contradistinction to the biological, physical conception that uh, Kant and Hegel had. Um, now, in Kant and Hegel's ideas, the races were hierarchically ordered. Um, now, the way Hegel put it was he said that the only historical people were the Europeans. He said that the Asian people, Asiatic people, weren't fully historical. They were mired in custom, and they tended to be have a kind of circle, cir circular history. They didn't innovate. The Africans and the Native Americans, he thought, didn't even have the culture the Asiatic peoples had. They were more savage. And uh, so they were prehistorical peoples. So the only real peoples that existed for, for Hegel at that time were the Europeans. Now he presented something that he, his philosophy of history was a development of freedom. And he saw, and which is kind of to his, his phenomenology. Um, so people are, um, uh, historical beings, and they will realize their nature historically, and when we realize our nature, we'll come to, as it were, an end of nature, uh, sorry, an end of history. When we realize our natures, by developing what's possible in our natures historically, we'll come to a point which will be the end of history, okay? Now, um, 
Du Bois, in his article, Conservation of Races, refers to something like an end of history moment. He says of a far off event that we're all working towards, when people of the different cultures of the world, the different races of the world, will be able to contribute to a world culture and it will unite us. This is, I think, the idea of universal history that we're working towards right now. I think that we've had a development of this idea, and I think that Du Bois has captured the stage of that idea today. And I think that's where we're at. So he famously said, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, right? I'm going to say to you that the problem of our future age, of our coming age, starting tomorrow, right, 2012, when we'll be at the end of one age and the beginning of a new age, I'm predicting, right, is the achieving of a universal history, of a story of the people in which everyone will be able to see themselves in the history of the world. We'll have a world history that doesn't privilege some set of people as the victors and 